Welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. The last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation, and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. My name is Andrea Sikora, and today I am looking forward to talking to all of you about getting smart about artificial intelligence, machine learning applications to pharmacy. On a personal note, my research program at the University of Georgia centers upon how we might be able to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to improving medication safety in the intensive care unit. Um, it also is going to be taking a look, hopefully, at workload allocation in the ICU so that we can make sure that we pharmacists have appropriate workloads to improve medication safety. And that has been an incredibly interesting journey over the last few years. However, with the advent of ChatGPT and some of these other you know, open access AI bots, I think this is about to be a time when we are going to be like remaking the face of healthcare and pharmacy and education. And as such, I really think that this is moving from a realm of you know, fun and interesting research to something that you know, we're going to be seeing on a far more day-to-day -day basis. So I'm excited to be talking to all of you about this. By the end of today's presentation, I hope that we will have discussed some of the core concepts relating to AI and machine learning in pharmacy practice, that we will have explored updates in how AI is being used in various settings um, in pharmacy practice from the community to the ICU, and also to facilitate the drug dispensing process. And finally, that we're going to identify how AI is going to impact potentially clinical decision making, uh, as well as other information technologies uh, in our profession, and also how it's going to impact pharmacy workflows. Again, I think that the power of this technology is incredibly far reaching in a way that I don't think we totally know how and where we're going to see all of these changes. But I do think we're going to see, you know, a whole nother level of ability to support clinical decision making, a whole nother level of, you know, basically uh, drug dose checking and uh, process dispensing type uh, improvements. And I think what's going to be really great about this is that it's going to free up time for uh, pharmacists and pharmacist technicians both to be doing higher level um, cognitive based activities. And, you know, I think that as wonderful as something like AI can be, I don't think it necessarily captures what it is to have a human interaction that discusses your therapy and troubleshoots different issues and things like that. And so I think that's going to be really the, to me, that is the promise of what AI can be. If you pull up almost any table of contents right now uh, in major journals, you're going to see something with machine learning or artificial intelligence. These are just a couple of screenshots here, one about the ability to predict individual risk of rheumatoid arthritis flares um, when you're managing biologic drugs, another one about the prediction response to cardiac resynchronization therapy using machine learning. What I find particularly interesting about the ability to have these more robust prediction models is that at the end of the day, we are all, every time we're using a drug therapy, we are assessing the 
the chance of benefit for that patient and the chance of harm for that patient. So you have a patient that has diabetes and hypertension and you start an ACE inhibitor and you're saying that the chances here of benefit that we're going to you know, manage their hypertension, reduce their risk of CKD, all these things you know, have good high chance of, of, of benefiting and that the harms of an ACE inhibitor we think are relatively low. But again, relatively doesn't mean perfectly low. And so, you know, it would be interesting for us if there were algorithms out there that could take drug knowledge as we see it and give us better percentages to look at. So there is a 95% chance of benefit for this patient and only a 2% chance of harm, per se. Or maybe you have someone who's based on, you know, specific characteristics, they have a 50% chance of benefit, but then a 40% chance of harm. And maybe that risk benefit profile doesn't, doesn't weigh out for us. And I think that those are the types of things that these types of predicting algorithms can really help us with, which is assimilating all of this medical information into mathematical models. And when you start having a person able to, like a true human being, able to use mathematical models to make decisions, that really can improve the quality of care that we are providing. So that part is very exciting. However, there's also been discussions essentially of should we be urging open, eye, open AI to halt chat GPT, pause AI, and so forth. So in this case, what's incredibly interesting, there was an interesting BBC article that was discussing how Elon Musk and others um, signed this kind of open letter uh, discussing the, the harms and the risks of basically this just race to develop ever better uh, AI systems and algorithms. And, you know, basically what the discussion was is AI systems with human competitive intelligence can pose profound risks to society and humanity. And that there needs to be thoughtfulness about how we're steering these these technologies. Um, there was an interesting uh, tweet that I saw recently, and it said something about, you know, the purpose of AI shouldn't be to create art. It should be to, you know, get groceries and pay the bill so that humans can make art. And, you know, I think that's a that's a conversation we need to be having is, you know, these non-human bots and things like that, are they eventually going to outnumber and outsmart us? <laughs> and are they going to be making many jobs obsolete? Um, much less more general threats to control over you know, civilization. There was a, an interesting one. It was like chaos GPT. And it was basically like, how would you create you know, mass global chaos? And you know, it had some pretty interesting ideas on that. And I'm not sure we really want to have some of the most powerful technologies in the world being used um, in, in that way. And so although I think there are still many discussions about what the regulatory authorities are going to be doing about this, it is something to really be thoughtful of. From a pharmacy perspective, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting elements to this. You know, there was an uh, article that came out in CVS using technology to fill prescriptions remotely. And essentially what they're using is a series of different technologies, including robots, automation and machine learning to fill prescriptions remotely. And what they're hoping is that this new approach is going to have a kind of a workload sharing uh, element to it across their 9,000 stores. But with the goal that what it's doing is freeing up the personnel in the pharmacy to deliver other medical services such as vaccinations, health screenings. You know, I think we all know that MTMs and um, patient counseling are incredibly important to patients, but oftentimes we're too busy to do them. So there is an element, again, where this could be, you know, really beneficial to patient care and may even improve, you know, the quality of life on the job. However, there's another component here that they are testing times without pharmacists directly on staff. And I think that part is, again, just a totally different ballgame than anything that we've been looking at uh, recently. To get started, I want to review some basic terminology that we are going to be using throughout uh, this presentation. So the first is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence describes basically the theory and development of the overarching systems that can perform human level uh, tasks, uh, including perception, language understanding, reasoning, learning, planning, problem solving. 
The part about artificial intelligence is that it's not just the mathematical or statistical algorithms. It's also the computer software, um, the hardware, all of those things that go into making um, the algorithms able to do uh, what they're capable of doing. Uh, machine learning specifically describes the computer system's ability to learn patterns from data and then use those patterns to make decisions. So the best kind of example that I use for this is, generally speaking, up until um, the advent of AI and machine learning, we did computer coding where we would tell the computer, you know, a rule. If you see this, you do this. So if you saw a red light, you would stop, and if you saw a green light, you would go. Whereas what machine learning does is it watches a traffic light, and it says, interestingly, it seems that most times uh, on green, cars go, and uh, most times on red, cars stop. And it learns that pattern and is able to predict and then make decisions as a result of it. An algorithm is a pre-programmed set of steps that, that the program follows. So again, algorithms can be um, entire, entirely uh, rule-based where we are totally in control as the person saying, if this, then do this. But it could also be uh, a set of basically prompts, if you will, to have the machine learn a pattern. So we say, go study this you know, traffic light situation and, and see what you come up with. And it, it follows you know, those types of prompts to learn new patterns that we were not expecting. And I think that's what's most interesting is that what, the, what a machine learning algorithm can show us is, yes, we can use it to, to do a better job with things that we already know you know, our likely relationships, you know, if you have hypertension, you have a higher risk of dementia, you know, that's something that we know, and we can still use machine learning to do a better job predicting that. But it may also find, you know, some kind of novel thing that we didn't know had anything to do with dementia. And we might say, huh, interesting, that's worthy of us going and studying and understanding in further detail. Another term that you're going to hear is about features. Features is how we describe data. So if you were to bring in a data set and it had, you know, age, sex, weight, home medications, things like that, age would be a feature in your algorithm. Sex would be a feature in your algorithm. And then from, in, from within that, you would have labels. And that's how you give value to those features. So for example, age is a number and it's a continuous variable. Whereas, of course, sex is a categorical variable. You know, we might have male, female, other, uh, and, and so forth. And that is really important. So when we start talking about what are the features and what are the labels, that gets into, is it supervised learning versus unsupervised learning? So pretty much any algorithm is going to have a feature associated with it. But the degree of labeling that goes into those features is very much part of um, the particular type of algorithm that we are building. So in particular, supervised learning often has labels that include very much more detailed labels on the input data uh, and as well as some degree of kind of the answer, if you will, um, on the output data. So you give it a set of data and you say, hey, you know, all of these patients, they had these characteristics or these features and they ultimately they did develop dementia. Can you find patterns within this or can you say how best to predict that? as opposed to another data set where you don't tell the, the machine whether or not they got dementia and you're having the machine identify kind of what's relevant about that population. So why AI in medicine? The potential has to do with you know, improved performance of our ability to diagnose, our ability to look at an EKG and say, yes, that's an arrhythmia, to look at a radiology report and say, yes, that's cancer. Um, also has to do with time efficiency, the ability for a natural language processing bot to help, you know, medical chart documentation or to help us figure out, you know, coding uh, from an ICD-10 perspective. The fact that we could potentially improve workflows and hospital flows through a unit in terms of discharge, you know, that can be reductions in cost. Um, these these things are, are important and, and very exciting to think about. Uh, Again, I think that there is excitement about improved patient care via the earlier detection and diagnosis of disease. 
you know, there's an interesting book called The First Cell, and the first cell is about the fact that cancer would be a whole heck of a lot easier to treat if we were dealing with the first couple of cells where cancer is, as opposed to, you know, an entire tumor that is, you know, millions of cells or even more than millions. Um, and the ability for us to kind of detect that at a very uh, early stage, you know, potentially could save a lot of lives. But we just haven't had the processing power to be able to assess that type of data in any meaningful capacity. Uh, again, improved workflow, I think, is a really interesting component. You know, I mean, I've always thought about when I do IV dose checking. I love to think that I'm a great pharmacist and that I do a good job IV dose checking uh, when people are making uh, mixtures for, you know, drips and stuff in the ICU, but I know that I'm not perfect. And, you know, even the concept that I could do a check and I know that it's being followed by, you know, another system, you know, I think that that is that's something that improves safety and could also improve workflow. Again, this kind of gets into reductions in medical errors, costs, morbidity, mortality. And, you know, there is, again, if you go take a you know quick search through PubMed right now, you can see all sorts of kind of exciting prospects. And I think that's why you're hearing more and more about this. Again, artificial intelligence is the broadest term that encompasses many other things uh, within it. You will sometimes hear these terms used interchangeably, but I do think it's important to understand that this is the science and engineering of creating intelligent machines that have the ability to uh, achieve goals that are similar to humans. But again, via a constellation of technologies, this includes anywhere from software chip development to the type of computer hardware to the machine learning, etc. From within that, you then have machine learning, which is again that computer's ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Um, from there, within that, there's another subset called deep learning. Deep learning is a subset of machine learning um, where the, the system can learn these hidden patterns uh, of data by themselves. Um, and oftentimes it can create far more efficient um, decision rules. So deep learning, again, is it's like mathematical modeling, statistical modeling, et cetera, that is kind of within machine learning. You know, technically, something like logistic regression, um, which we, you know, see fairly frequently in the literature, odds ratios and so forth, you know, we consider this kind of fairly standard in terms of um, statistical methodology. Technically, that's actually machine learning, um, and you can use logistic regression within this, whereas deep learning, again, is kind of its, its own beast. Um, and you'll hear things about neural networks, uh, recurrent neural networks, concurrent neural networks, et cetera, and all of that, again, is a, is a subset. So as I have been alluding to kind of throughout this introductory section, there are some main kind of categories or flavors of machine learning algorithms. And I think that they're helpful to understand from, from a broad perspective when you're evaluating uh, literature that is using these for some type of patient care application, but then again, just to kind of understand what is happening within healthcare. So these three categories are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So supervised learning, the concept is that the, the algorithm is truly supervised. And what this means is that we're giving it a coded data set. And that coded data set is saying, you know, this patient developed hypertension and this patient didn't. And here are all the characteristics that are associated with or that those patients had. And then the machine goes in and learns about um, that, those patients and those characteristics. And it's able to do things like classification learning. So in this case, it might be able to say, OK, you know, based on this coded data set where I had the answers, I can now correctly classify whether someone's going to have hypertension or not have hypertension as a result um, with a new data set where you don't give it the answers. So again, unsupervised learning, you don't give it any answers. It figures it out on its own or identifies patterns and then asks you know, the user, are these important or not? So, you know, for example, we worked on an unsupervised learning algorithm trying to look at clusters of medications in the ICU that were associated with adverse events. Um, and while what was interesting about it was it did come up with clusters and it did seem to show really interesting patterns of adverse events, but the clusters themselves weren't super meaningful from a, from a pharmacist's perspective. And so, 
what we did is we said, okay, this is interesting, but you know, can we do slightly better? And so we added more features to the algorithm, kind of tried some different methods, and we started to try to find kind of more clinically relevant clusters. But again, the, the machine, the algorithm is, you know, who is deriving those, those clusters from its own pattern analysis. Reinforcement learning is another kind of classic paradigm of machine learning. And essentially, it, it, what it does is it rewards desired behaviors or punishes undesired behaviors um, through some process. And then it takes actions through that to kind of learn through trial and error. So if you ever see a picture kind of explaining reinforcement learning, you'll see that, you know, it has the, the algorithm similar to the others, but then you give it more information to kind of reward versus punish um, the various things that, that, it, that it identifies. This schematic uh, helps to depict what supervised learning does. So you can see here we have an input data set, and you can see that we have four uh, stars. And we have annotations or, or coding that says, hey, machine, these are stars. And so then the machine goes and does its algorithm, and it learns all about stars. So it might see that it's five points. It might see that it's a decadent. It might see that it's equilateral. It might notice that they tend to be yellow as opposed to other colors. And from there, you put in a test data set, and you give it all sorts of shapes, circles, squares, stars, pentagons, etc. And it is able to say, hey, I found a star out of this machine or out of this data set. And so that's kind of the classification concept. You can also take classification of it's a star or it's not a star and do predictions. So, you know, you learn all about different, you know, I don't know, individuals and what they might may be willing to draw or something like that, and you're able to predict that it's going to be a star. Um, and so this ability to predict and classify can be a very helpful functionality. From the perspective of evaluating the literature, you're going to find that there are tons of supervised learning methods, naive Bayes, decision trees, random forests, support vector machines, something called XGBoost. And they all have kind of different general descriptors. They have you know, different general concepts that they're using. So for example, with random forest, you have these you know, individual decision trees. You know, If this, it's this, if that, it's that. Um, and they operate as kind of what they call an ensemble. And so each individual tree spits out a, a prediction. And from there, uh, the machine as a whole says, okay, based on all of these different decision trees, we have the most votes for this, and therefore that's our, that's our decision. Um, you know, the bigger thing I want you to take from this necessarily than, than understanding the, the particulars of XGBoost versus Random Forest is just to see that there's a lot out there and there's new new algorithms that are being developed all the time. This is, you know, a huge area of mathematical and computer science research. Uh, and so when you're evaluating the literature and you see something, what's helpful is to say, okay, has this, um, you know, been studied in this O1? Is it supervised or unsupervised? How are they setting that up? But then from there, why did they choose this particular uh, method to approach this problem. And sometimes they're able to cite different literature, hey, this has been used for similar problems, X, Y, and Z, so we thought it made sense. Sometimes you'll see situations where basically the investigators said, hey, we have no clue, so we tried five things. Um, sometimes, you know, in, in the world of traditional uh, stats, you might say, are they trying to p-hack or are they just trying to, like, find things? But because we're still very much in an early stage of understanding machine learning and AI and how to apply it, sometimes the best method is truly trial and error um, when we're evaluating, uh, you know, what methods to use. In contrast to supervised learning, an unsupervised machine learning approach takes a data set that, again, does not have annotations or answers. So in continuing with the shapes metaphor here, you can see we have circles, squares, stars, triangles. And we put this into the unsupervised algorithm and say, tell us about it. And it does something called feature extraction. Feature extraction is basically looking at your data set and saying, huh, it's interesting that you know, some are purple, some are blue, some are yellow, some have three points, some have four points, some have no points. So it's learning features about your data set. And from there, it does classification. So it says, okay, it seems like there is a particular, you know, data point here that they're all green colored, they have three points, they'll equilateral, and that's something that we think is interesting. 
So then it organizes your output data, and so you have an organization here, and you can see that we have a group of stars, we have a group of squares, we have a group of triangles. From there, um, depending on how the algorithm works, it may be able to say, hey, I think this is actually a triangle, um, like, you know, because based on, you know, my corpus of literature or corpus of information that you have, you know, using the Internet or something like that. Or, you know, more so in my work, what happens is we get these different groupings and then the machine more or less says, OK, what do you think? And then it's our job to interpret um, the meaningfulness of that information. Similar to supervised learning, there are many, many unsupervised learning algorithms out there. So just a few here are image processing, computer vision, artificial neural networks, convolutional neural networks, uh, and so forth. And so again, all of these are mathematical processes that are being used to uh, achieve some task. So a buddy of mine showed me a very, very neat um, app on your phone that is AI based and it, it's a it's a photo editor. So I had a really cute picture that I had taken, but it happened to be that there was a like a hair tie on the floor that was kind of messing up the vibe of the picture. And she goes, oh, that's no problem. And so what she did was put it into her app and then literally erased the hair tie like it had never been there at all. And so, you know, essentially what happens in this situation is that you have pixels on a picture and the pixels are encoded by math and by encoded by code. And what it does is it says, hey, interestingly, you had tan colored carpet and then there was the black of this hair tie. And what you're asking in this situation is, can you make this image not have kind of the aberrant property, which is this strange black hair tie? And so what it did is it just copied the pixels over into a pattern that kind of looks like my carpet and copied over where that black hair tie was. And, you know, it's incredible that this is lightning fast and the amount of, you know, again, mathematics and technology that goes into this. Um, Neural networks are really interesting in that they have this ability to model really complex relationships, particularly they can model like nonlinear and what's called non-monotone relationships. And that's really a, a big limitation that we have in current traditional modeling, which really basically allows for linear relationships, logistic relationships, and sometimes we can do what's called a spline where we basically like connect a few different of these relationships into one system, but that gets really difficult. And the problem is that within healthcare and within health in general, there are many patterns and relationships that exist, but they're not in a strictly linear fashion. And so really this is the first time, you know, in humanity we've been able to really cope with these types of nonlinear patterns. Um, before that, this was basically solely the purview of, you know, kind of what people might have called our intuition uh, prior to that point. So neural networks in particular here, they have, you know, these input layers and they have what are called these hidden layers where they're kind of making different connections. If you see the pictures, you'll see all these different kind of interlocking kind of lines and relationships that looks a lot like you know, the circuitry of, of the brain in terms of neurons, and then it has its output layer, which is basically the result of whatever you were looking for. A little bit more about reinforcement learning. So again, this is one of those kind of different paradigms, um, and, it's a, and it's a machine learning approach where the computer learns to make decisions on its own by making lots of decisions and kind of a trial and error setup. Um, it's most often used when it's like learning how to play games. So if you hear about a machine learning algorithm that's learned how to play Pac-Man or chess or something like that, what it's doing is it's trying something and then it's seeing did it get rewarded or punished as a result of, of making that decision. And over time, it's able to make different rules and patterns for itself of how to best, you know, kind of attack that uh, or tackle that, that particular problem. This schematic here just kind of shows you again all the different flavors that we have within machine learning. And again, there's different, you know, algorithms and approaches and there's new ones coming out every day. And so again, you can see here that we're breaking down between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. You can see that within supervised learning, you have more regression based techniques versus classification techniques. And then with unsupervised learning, you have more clustering versus what's called dimensionality reduction, which is looking at how can you take really, really complex 
data sets and reduce the number of dimensions or elements so we can make decisions. And again, you can see here the difference between that kind of clustering, hey, here are some patterns that you see with unsupervised versus more of that classification prediction that you see with uh, supervised learning. So which of the following is not a type of supervised learning? A, random forest, B, neural networks, C, naive bays, D, regression learning, or E, classification learning? The correct answer here is B, neural networks. Neural networks are a type of unsupervised learning. Um, and so what this means here is that you are giving the model a you know, corpus of data and it is identifying its own patterns uh, and seeing what, what makes sense. Whereas supervised learning, you are giving it labeled data. That's the supervision aspect of it. So you're saying, you know, here's an image and this image is a dog and that's the correct thing. As opposed to saying, you know, giving it a bunch of images of dogs, cats, lions, zebras, and having it figure out that, you know, all of the, the Dalmatian and the Labrador and the Poodle are all truly dogs. Probably one of the most exciting domains of machine learning is the element of natural language processing. Uh, natural language processing is really an overlap between the fields of computer science as well as the fields of linguistics. And you are seeing that overlap that is kind of achieved through the methodology that AI and machine learning allow. So, you know, put simply, it basically allows machines to interpret uh, human language, uh, speech, or text and to provide something coherent back. So if you've ever used Siri or Alexa, or more recently ChatGPT, all of these are natural language processing systems that are understanding the questions and then giving responses back. From here, I just want to talk about some of the different uh, machine learning applications that are in daily life that are things that you may see regardless of whether you realize that that was uh, being powered by AI or not. Some that you are probably relatively familiar with include Google Maps, as well as, again, virtual assistants like Siri, Alexa, Google Assistant, um, as well as social media. So if you have ever had Facebook or Instagram say, hey, is this you in a picture, and ask if you want to tag it, that is actually um, image processing, which is, again, a machine learning algorithm that is saying, hey, this looks like you. Uh, Google Maps. When it's estimating your you know, time to commute, uh, various smart devices, it is, again, using machine learning algorithms to, to do that. Again, anytime you're seeing something where we're seeing interpreting of text uh, or, or human language, that is most likely natural language processing at play. Probably one of the most interesting uh, is credit card fraud detection. So this is using you know, enormous data sets. Um, and is able to effectively figure out what charges are you and what charges are not you. And it does this via its ability to have, you know, a very, uh, you know, large data set, but also a data set that has answers. Yes, this was fraudulent or no, it wasn't, um, to learn these different patterns. And what I find really incredible about this is that it is able to, um, I took a trip and I forgot to set up my credit card to you know, know that I was going abroad. And so I you know, drove to Atlanta, which I do all the time because my family lives there, got on an airplane, and the next thing you know, I was in um, Helsinki. And then my next credit card charge after Helsinki was getting on a boat um, to go across over to um, Copenhagen. And it had no problems with that. It allowed me to use my credit card, never a piece of fraud within that at all, even though I had bought the airline ticket on a different flight. Um, and then when I returned home a few weeks later, it was able to correctly say, hey, this uh, credit card charge for gas in California, is this you? And I definitely was not me. I was not in California. So it's pretty uh, incredible what it is capable of detecting. 
So from there, how are we using AI in pharmacy and where do we think we're going? Um, one domain is inventory management. And anyone that has ever worked at an independent pharmacy or worked in any domain associated with inventory knows that this is, you know, the lifeblood of your budget and your ability to, you know, make a profit and the ability to use prediction algorithms to analyze what you're using, what you're not using and make, um, you know, suggestions is really very powerful. Um, personnel allocations, the ability to, you know, analyze your your high times and low times or your rushes and, and so forth to know when you should be scheduling people uh, is going to be another source of efficiency. Um, we're already seeing AI used for drug discovery and kind of what they call high throughput, you know, chemical analysis. And so basically they're looking at, you know, large volumes of data about different chemical entities saying, do we think this could be an effective drug based on its pharmacology and, you know, different things we know about different disease states. Um, and again, you know, the kind of the stuff that, uh, my team is working on has to do with how can you use the electronic health record to kind of mine um, this huge data set and understand how we can improve medication use and clinical decision making for that matter. Within the realm of hospital pharmacy, we're seeing uh, the Google DeepMind Health Project, um, which assists to basically evaluate medical records in a short span of time to be able to maintain the records as well as optimize the information that's within them. Uh, we have Medical Sieve, which is an algorithm that was launched by IBM that is uh, a cognitive assistant, uh, and it has this kind of, you know, decent analytical and reasoning ability uh, to help detect anomalies um, when looking within clinical information from imaging to text, uh, clinical data, and stuff like that. So basically looking for mistakes and errors within the chart. Um, and then there's also an interesting one called Molly, which is a startup company, a uh, virtual nurse, and it uh, aims to guide the treatment of patients uh, with a chronic condition in between doctor's visits. So it's again, it's the idea here is that you're going to be able to have, you know, uh, input different information and have, you know, better, better, you know, I guess, guidance as to what to do. You start a new blood pressure medicine, you put in your blood pressure and this tells you what to do. The intensive care unit presents a really interesting application for artificial intelligence because there is a lot of, one, a lot of data that critically ill patients generate because we have hourly ins and outs and labs multiple times a day and hourly vital signs, and all that kind of stuff. But in addition to that, ICU patients tend to be uh, not uh, homogenous at all. They're a very heterogeneous patient population, which can make them difficult to study. And so the ability to use um, these kind of, you know, more advanced processing methods to understand these patients uh, is a really, really exciting area. And so and there's a number of different prediction areas and, you know, applications that we're seeing in the ICU, but some that we've looked at include length of stay, um, ICU mortality, sepsis prediction, um, ARDS prediction, as we've already discussed, uh, cardiac uh collapse or cardiogenic shock prediction. There's a lot, a lot of areas that are coming out that are really quite exciting. One example is a group that trained a support vector machine algorithm using about 15,000 patients using SOFA scores to uh, predict length of stay. And they found that they were able to get um, an area under the receiver operating characteristic of about 0 0.82 compared to when they asked um, physicians in the study for the length of stay. And I think what's interesting here is that, you know, if you have an idea that someone is settling in for the long haul of an ICU stay, you make different decisions than if you think, hey, we can get this patient out of here. I think it also helps us dictate goals of care conversations and, you know, a number of different interventions. So this ability to kind of accurately predict what we think is going to happen to these patients is a very, very useful uh, element. This study used a number of different supervised uh, machine learning algorithms to predict IC mortality. And what you can see here is that blue line, um, which has the most area under it uh, compared to the others, uh, performed the best. And this in particular, I think what's interesting is it outperformed some of the traditional scoring tools that we use, like Apache, SOFA, and SNAPS. And given that these are kind of standards, it's definitely interesting to realize that we maybe have better ways to go about this. Um, you know, another element that I think is really interesting is that 
SOFA, Apache, et cetera, they are standardized to a single population or maybe a couple of different populations, and then we started using them for everybody. Whereas the beauty of some of these algorithms is that you could train it uh, with different data sets and adapt it to different institutions. So you kind of have like this base structure that you can then tweak, which is pretty interesting. Because sepsis is so lethal and so quickly, there's always been a big focus on how can we rapidly identify these patients to uh, intervene quickly. Because while it is deadly, uh, it is also highly intervenable if we're able to give you know, antibiotics and so forth. And so this algorithm here uh, was able to uh, predict sepsis earlier than traditional tools, um, which is really exciting. But I think this study is also important to note in that it did not actually improve clinical outcomes. And so um, the tool was helpful. The clinical team had predicted sepsis in greater than 50% of the cases already. And so, you know, I think another 50%, I mean, that's, you know, probably what, 450 or so of these patients. Yeah, that's significant that we can do something. But I think this speaks to just because you can have a fun toy that can do something interesting, like predict sepsis early, doesn't mean we know how to implement that toy in a meaningful way. and doesn't mean that even when we do implement it, that it actually works. Um, in this case, I think there is a possibility that we're just limited by sample size and limited by the trial design in terms of really seeing outcomes. But I do think that this is important um, for you all as pharmacists and pharmacy technicians that when we're looking at uh, a new piece of AI based technology, okay, it's cool, it can do this thing, but can it do it better than what's already being done? And how is it truly improving things? And has that actually been evaluated? And I think a lot of times right now we run into situations where we have not evaluated that uh, as rigorously as we need to. This algorithm is pretty interesting in that it was trained using uh, ventilator asynchrony data to see if it could identify ventilator asynchronies. And they found that this machine worked about as well as the human experts. I think what's particularly interesting here is that uh, different types of medica mechanical ventilation asynchronies are can be pretty difficult to parse out. And you can even have you know, highly trained ICU physicians who don't necessarily know all the different types of asynchrony that are out there. I remember I had a conversation where I wanted to ask a question about a type of uh, asynchrony called reverse triggering. And it was actually the first time that this ICU physician had heard of it. And he is a, you know, a very well-respected and a very effective, you know, and competent clinician. But it just kind of speaks to there's, you know, there's always things we don't know. And so what's interesting about something like this is this could be potentially a surveillance technique that's going on in the background. And you, you know, you have an alert and say, hey, will you come look at this? And then the human expert comes over and says, yep, that's an asynchrony and we'll do this or this to, you know, fix it. So how is AI being used in pharmacy? A, predicting early detection of sepsis, uh, assisting in repetitive tasks, C, EHR mining, D, analyzing asynchrony and mechanical ventilation, or E, all of the above. So already we are seeing a lot of AI being used in healthcare and in pharmacy in particular. And so the answer here is all of the above. Um, this is already where we're seeing AI being applied. And I think we're only going to see more of this. Now, I will note that these are things at times that are more research based or, you know, or, you know, specifically investigation based at this time. But some of them are, you know, things that we're using, you know, for direct patient care. Beyond the ICU and healthcare, you know, we have this enormous advent of large language models and natural language processing tools that have become open source. And, you know, what's fascinating about open source is that it means that you can take the code and then go and tweak it to do things on your own, um, which is pretty cool and scary in its own way, um, because it allows for a very large populace to work on uh, this type of algorithm as opposed to, you know, only behind closed doors. And on top of it, they've made it highly user friendly. If you've ever opened up the chat GPT function, you know, you, you 
log in, um, which is free, and you can use like your Google account even. And then you get a prompt and you can say things like, how would you manage pseudomonas pneumonia? Or can you write me a sonnet about love and nature? And it will do that for you, which is pretty incredible. Uh, so these are just a few different uh, article titles that I think are kind of interesting. And so, you know, this one is pretty fascinating. It can pass the U.S. medical licensee ex exam uh, pretty well, diagnose various conditions that are one in 100,000 uh, fairly quickly. Uh, it also, I think, is remaking what education is going to look like. You know, I personally, I consider myself a writer as well. I think that there's a lot of value in the written word and particularly the human journey with the written word. I mean, you'll hear things about, you know, the importance of journaling or the or the you know value of journaling. And I think that there's something about the ability to truly understand the material you're working with uh, with regard to writing it that you can't get by having a machine write it. But at the same time, you know, it's going to be, you know, more difficult to say, how do we know this is a real essay that a student wrote versus something in chat GPT? Is that good? Is that bad? Uh, what jobs is this replacing? All that kind of stuff. And I think we're, we're very much living, you know, within those questions right now. So the chat generative pre-trained transformer or chat GPT is a conversational chatbot. Um, it uses a large language model, and there have been multiple iterations up until this point. It's created by OpenAI, and what kind of makes it interesting is that not, not only does it have natural language processing components to it, but it also employs supervised and reinforcement learning strategies that help it to train its responses and give better responses over time. There is no doubt that something like ChatGPT uh, and its, you know, soon to be successors are very powerful programs. But I think at the current time point, we don't entirely have a feeling for how we can use it or what it can do for us. Um, and I think that that's really going to be a key area over the next, you know, few years is to really understand the strengths and the limitations of this tool. So studies like this that are coming out of Vanderbilt. They had different physicians present different medical questions and cases and then had the chat GPT system try to answer the questions. And then it, you know, it would over time, they would look at them. The physicians would look at them, rate their accuracy and then give them back to chat GPT to then learn more from from that information. They found that the accuracy score was relatively high at five, um, although the completeness score was around three. Um, and I found this as well. I was playing around with chat GPT, asking a different drug information questions. And what I found was that the information was not wrong. Um, it was accurate and it was, you know, reasonably nuanced in terms of like, you know, bringing in different facts that I wanted to know. But at the same time, it was definitely not complete. And I also didn't feel like it was super well prioritized. And so it's kind of like the difference between, you know, me saying, hey, can you tell me about lisinopril? And you pull out the package insert and start reading the package insert to me, as opposed to being able to tell me, you know, it's an ACE inhibitor. It's first line in hypertension with diabetes. It can cause a cough. You know, that that ability that a person can do so rapidly. Uh, this system, I think, still struggles uh, in that way. And I would say that my experience with the accuracy versus completion element appears to be in line with uh, this author's conclusion, as well as just other authors in general that are kind of discussing this, which is, you know, it it has high accuracy and it has reasonable completeness across various specialties. But we're really going to need to have a lot more um, deployment evaluations of how you would use this and to think through, you know, what we want to do with it. Now, I do think, you know, a, a more specialized, you know, basically what this could ultimately be is almost like a fancier Google search, you know, as opposed to going, oh, remember that line in this one movie? And I think Reese, w Reese Witherspoon's in it. And then Google kind of is able to come up with it. You know, this would be able to provide us a, you know, I have a patient case. I've got these four things. I'm not quite sure. And, you know, you're almost using chat GPT or something else as like a curbside consult. It might not be your last place that you're stopping and you're not necessarily going to, you know, rely on it 100 percent. But it might give you some ideas that you wouldn't otherwise have. And it can do so very rapidly. What techniques does chat GPT employ to be so effective? Natural language processing, reinforcement learning, supervised learning or all of the above?
So the answer here for what techniques does ChatGPT or for that matter GPT-4 employ and the answer here is all of the above. So it is using natural language processing um, which is a form of unsupervised learning and it also uses unsu um, other unsupervised learning techniques and it also uses something called reinforcement learning um, particularly with regard to human feedback. So there's actually times when the person gives feedback to the machine uh, and then that feedback kind of creates these different like reward based models and so it it weights things differently within the mathematical models based on those rewards. I mean this is similar to basically when you say okay the purpose of this you know algorithm is to you know play chess and so it learns via reinforcement learning um, because it's basically maximizing this reward function um, for every time it you know it wins a game um, which is kind of interesting to think about. We have a very exciting period over the next few years in terms of, I think, how we're going to be employing uh, machine learning in the healthcare environment. You know, one of the things I think is going to be incredibly interesting is the domain of wearables. Um, so we kind of are already familiar with some of these things in terms of something like the Apple Watch or the fact that uh, this Garmin watch that I had could, you know, do an EKG for me and things like that. And the ability to potentially wear a monitoring device that can, one, detect things, but then also potentially give a recommendation like you need to go to the hospital for this or something like that is a pretty powerful thing, especially when we think about how difficult it can be to get in to a healthcare professional, uh, which is an unfortunate reality in the U.S., but is nonetheless very true. Uh, again, I think chat GPT can be very helpful from a diagnosis perspective as well as, a, you know, a, a treatment gut check. I think those are things that are coming. Uh, I think this large scale biomarker analysis is going to be really interesting as well. You know, we know we have you know, millions of different chemicals within us and different biomarkers, proteins, hormones, etc. that we know that they come together to make different diseases happen. And yet our ability to detect them in the right quantities and the right, you know, I guess, constellations in some meaningful fashion, you know, we've never been able to do that. And so the ability that potentially you could, you know, get a sample and you do this kind of, you know, fancy biomarker analysis and come up with, you know, risk factors for disease or diagnosis for disease that you otherwise would have taken years to get. I think those are really exciting elements. From an education perspective, I think we always have to strike a balance of knowing what we can look up and knowing what baseline level of knowledge that you have to have in order to know you need to look something up. And this is sometimes a conversation I have with students where they're like, why do I need to know that lisinopril is an ACE inhibitor and it might cause a cough? And it's like, well, you know, you have to have a baseline vocabulary about drugs, drug therapy, what we're working on in order to assess a patient and know what you're looking for and know how to connect those dots. And it's yes, you can have tools that help you if you forget things or you're not quite sure of the dose. But if you don't have a working vocabulary, it's pretty hard to do anything. Uh, Another component to this, and so, you know, one of the challenges of things like chat GPT is how do we set up meaningful learning experiences, essentially, that students can't game the system so that they're still able to learn the information they need to learn. On the flip side, we can't demonize AI and say that you're never going to see it or it's not important. You know, this is kind of like the, you know, you you have to learn rote math because you're never going to have a calculator with you all the time, except for, of course, now with a, you know, with a smartphone, you do have a calculator with you all the time. But I still think it's important to be able to do basic addition and subtraction. And, you know, so there's going to be a balance here of understanding what the technologies can and cannot do. And I think that there's, you know, this competency of how to how to use these technologies is going to be really important. And, you know, one thing I found really interesting with even this my current generation of students is that from a generational perspective, they know all sorts of cool things on a cell phone that I don't necessarily spend my time dealing with. So even I was talking about earlier that photo imaging software and, you know, there's all sorts of kind of cool things that are like that that are using AI that students are kind of peripherally aware of. But then, you know, when I ask them to like do something with a Microsoft Word document or use a citation software or, you know, you have to like give me access on a Google Doc to use it, they're like, oh, I'm so bad with technology. And so what I'm finding is that there is a technology fluency that people have, but then also how to apply it and how to use it in a workplace they don't necessarily have. And so there's going to be a really interesting balance here. 
And again, I think one of the more important components is going to be how do you assess and analyze this literature to understand what's quality work and what's not. And one of the most important things is, again, just because it can do a cool thing like pass the medical exam doesn't mean that it should actually take care of a patient. And that's where the implementation studies are going to be so important. So I think there's a lot more to come in this area. And I appreciate uh, having all of you here today and look forward to taking your questions. So in conclusion, um, you know, AI is something that is just rapidly exploding. We're seeing lots of new things every single day. I'm actually reading a book about uh, GPT-4 and chat GPT by um, the CEO of OpenAI. And, you know, he's sitting there kind of saying even as the CEO and, you know, with these other big, de you know, developers in the field that are helping write this book, you know, by the time it's published and by the time you read it, it's probably going to be mildly out of date. Um, and, you know, it is interesting to even to see to see some of that and also to see how, you know, he's kind of re referencing certain limitations with chat GPT and GPT-4. Um, in healthcare, and then you know, as I'm sitting there, I was like, oh, okay. I, you know, my team and I had a similar idea. We're working on a project about that, and all of this is just such a rapid development. Um, and I, so I think it's going to be very exciting for everyone to kind of have an understanding of this and to understand how we can best use it, um, you know, for the good. But I do want to point out that you know, as much as I think people are fearful of this is going to replace different jobs, I do think some some functions within jobs will likely be replaced by this. But yeah, I think that's always been the case of new technology. But I also think what this is ultimately going to do is make us you know basically do a better job. You know, so you're going to have situations where you 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 make a decision. Okay, I think this is what the patient needs or has or whatever. I'm going to run it through this model one time and just see what I get. And you can't have blind reliance on that model, of course. But it can certainly be a really solid double check. And when are we ever against you know double checking our math in that way when it comes to you know a patient's life? So thank you all for listening and excited to take any questions you may have.